appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you a little bit today about kudzu bug. Uh, official name, by the way, is the bean plataz bug, but that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, so we'll, we'll call it kudzu bug throughout the talk. And we'd like to acknowledge my uh, my co-authors and uh, collaborators, uh, Yenjua Chung and uh, Scott Horn. Uh, Scott, by the way, is a raised in Alabama and graduated from Auburn. So. Um, just a little bit about kudzu. Uh, some people refer to kudzu as the vine that ate the south. It's a rapid growing uh, woody vine. It grows at a rate of up to one foot per day. And uh, it can have a massive root system uh, up to 12 feet deep and 300 pounds uh, on the tap root. So this, it's a, a major uh, weed and it kills trees by growing up over the tops of them and shading them out. Uh, its range is uh, quite a bit broader than what most people think. It does go all the way up into the Midwest and, and they even have some up in Canada. But the primary part of the range is, is the south. Uh, from southern Virginia through North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, and Alabama into Mississippi. So that's where, where kudzu is primarily a problem. Some facts that you probably didn't know about kudzu is that it's native to Asia and it uh, was introduced in 1876 at the uh, Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. And people would come and marvel. They had the exhibit set up so you could actually see how much it grew each day and they would come back each day and see and marvel at how fast this thing could grow. And for whatever reason, they thought that would be a great thing to have in their house. So it became a, uh, a uh, ornamental. People, uh, they started promoting it as an ornamental after a while, when it took over their houses, they, they decided that wasn't such a good idea. And so, uh, so then it became, uh, we started promoting it as a forage crop. Uh, it is a good forage crop for uh, cattle. It's hard to harvest for, for hay storage and, uh, and also start to take people's farms over. So they decided that wasn't so good. Then uh, in the, during the Depression, uh, they needed to control a lot of soil erosion, so they started to distribute it and even paid people to plant it. Uh, for erosion control, and did a very good job of that. By 1946, there were uh, nearly 3 million acres uh, planted. So, in 1999, Time Magazine listed it as Kudzu's introduction as one of the 100 worst ideas of the century. <laughs> and uh, today, it's considered a federal noxious weed, and it occupies, uh, and the estimates are really shaky. It's hard to know exactly how much, but uh, the estimates are up to uh, 7 million acres. And it's also estimated to uh, take over about 100,000 acres a year. Uh, as far as forestry is concerned, uh, this, is, this equals about 100 to 500 million dollars in estimated losses uh, in potential productivity of that land were occupied by, by forest. So this is being the plantasmid or the kudzu bug. Uh, it looks like a monster on the screen, but it's only about the size of a pencil eraser. It's uh, fairly small. It is a, a Type of stink bug, so it produces a nasty odor like other stink bugs. Uh, it uh, feeds by piercing, sucking mouth parts, uh, by sucking the juices out of the plants. It's also a native of Asia. Uh, first discovered near Atlanta uh, on houses in 2009. It's spreading rapidly throughout uh, the South, and it's a a new family, Plotasmidae is a new family for North America, and it has this interesting obligate bacteria that it has to have for it to survive, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, in China, it's widely, or not China, but in Asia, it's widely distributed, up to two, three generations per year. It has uh, a, a big uh, list of hosts, primarily legumes in, in Asia, but a lot of that literature is based on just somebody seeing it on a plant and saying it's a it's Host for it, and in most cases, I don't think those are true, so it's probably a much lim more limited uh, host range. It is not considered a major pest of soybeans, so this is your first hint that this is not the panacea that we would love it to be for Kudzu. It's got other issues associated with it. Uh, and it was introduced from Japan, based, and that's based on Tracy Jenkins' work at the University of Georgia. This is the range right now of the Kudzu bug, and you can see that center pink area was where it was the first nine counties where it was discovered in 2009 and since then it's spread throughout uh, all the way up into northern or southern Virginia and across the, most of Alabama now. And this is pretty typical you know, in the south. You see a lot of kudzu around people's houses and 
old fields near, near those uh, neighborhoods and things like that. Uh, in the wintertime, when it gets hit by a hard frost, because it dies back to the ground, all the, all the new growth, all the growth you see in a year is, is new growth. And the bugs have to go somewhere. One of the things they do is they like to, they like to go into bark crevices. That's a favorite overwintering site for them. Uh, another spot they like is people's houses. And uh, they show up on houses in very large numbers in, in the fall of the year. Uh, so this is how it was discovered. Somebody noticed it on their houses and took it to Home Depot. And the person at Home Depot got it to the extension the service uh, to get it identified. Needless to say, when you show up in your house in large numbers in the fall, that's, that's not great. Uh, you know, it's time of year, great time of year to be outside and, and having sink folks flying around and landing in your iced tea is not great. So we were uh, interested in trying to find out uh, what the, the biology of the kudzu bug was uh, on kudzu and then uh, whether it was going to have a significant impact on kudzu. So we did some studies in 2010 and 2011 uh, looking at the biology, and we also developed a simple uh, monitoring method for it, and then uh, for the past three years, and we're continuing this work to measure the, uh, what its impact on, on the Kudzu in the Athens area. So the eggs, this is what they look like. Uh, they're laid in, uh, usually in two rows like this, and if you look, Real closely on the underside there, there's some dark spots. If you flip it over, you can see those uh, are little capsules of bacteria. And the female deposits those as she's laying the eggs. And then when the nymphs hatch, they stay around the egg mass and, and feed on those before they leave to go feed on the plant. And that's how they pick up the bacteria that they need uh, to be able to survive. They can survive without it, but they don't do very well and they won't reproduce very well without it. They go through uh, five instars, uh, from uh, the ones right out of the egg, the first instar off, to that uh, the one on that looks almost like an adult right there. Um, one of the things we were interested in was coming up with a way we could monitor it. Uh, and we kind of had, had this idea that maybe it's attracted to white. And so uh, we decided to try some different uh, different colors of traps, and sure enough, white was the uh, most attractive color. It does come to yellow somewhat, but, uh, but it definitely prefers white. So those traps have been very useful for us in our studies. Um, and, and we ran those traps then throughout the year to get an idea of just how many uh, generations we have here in the south. And so uh, it overwinters in this period as adults. So these are just adults doing absolutely nothing until the spring when it warms up, they pop out and either if the kudzu's out, they'll go right to the kudzu fields. If the kudzu's not out, they will go to people's houses and wander around for whatever reason. Um, what those then, these are the females will lay eggs and that'll go through, those eggs will hatch and they'll go through a complete generation and start emerging as adults in uh, July and August. Now, unfortunately, part of that uh, generation then leaves and goes off to soybeans, and um, uh, it can complete a generation on soybeans as well. The rest of them, the ones that stay, they lay eggs and they go through a second generation, and then uh, these are the adults that will overwinter. And this is what it looks like when it shows up on soybeans. Uh, these are adults that have just that come into the field. They will, as I said, lay eggs on soybeans and they can see the generation there. One of the things we were interested in is uh, whether or not it was affecting kudzu, so we did something that nobody else does, we protected kudzu. And um, we did it by spraying the plots every two weeks with an insecticide, uh, specifically to keep the bugs off, because we needed bug-free plots that we could compare to the plots that they, the bugs were on to see what impact it was having on them. And I, I want to point out, you know, if you look at just how lush and uh, nice looking that kudzu is and how deep it is, uh, I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit to show you what kind of a visual effect of what the, the bug's having. Um, and we kept the, the borders weeded. In September then we uh, harvested the kudzu in the center of the plot, and that's kind of a crude uh, 
removing the kudzu, and that's what it looks like after we're done. Take it back to the lab and sort it out, looking at whether or not it was affecting the seed, uh, the, the uh, stems or the leaves. It turns out it's affecting the plant equally. It doesn't matter. But it does the same amount of damage to stems and leaves. Uh, oven dry and weigh it to get a biomass, to get some idea of how much uh, is actually in the plots. And what we found was that uh, that first year in 2010, if I can point to that, uh, we had about a 33% reduction uh, in the growth of uh, kudzu from the, from the bugs feeding. And we think it was actually more than that because it turns out that deer like their, their kudzu without bugs. And so they were actually foraging in our, our control plots where we had sprayed. Um, they were actually foraging in there. So they're actually reducing the biomass a fair amount. In fact, we quit spraying the second year because the deer just are not were annihilating our, our spray plots. And so we, we figured we have an absolute, we may actually have less in the spray plots than we did in the uh, kudzu bug infested plots if we kept going. Um, but we did continue to harvest it every year, and, and that second year we had a 52% 50, uh, reduction compared to that year 2009, and then in 2012 it was a uh, 42% reduction. So consistently we're getting you know, 30 to 50% reduction in, in the, uh, the amount of kudzu out there. That has to have a, a pretty big effect on the plant. And so this is a give you an idea. So this is a picture of Mike Cody standing out there, and you see the cut through his line and the crotch deep to waist deep on him there. And there's there are no other plants growing out there in, in that cut through field that first year. The, this is 2012, where Andrew all standing in that plot, and um, the, the cut through bug had nothing to do with the sign coming up in the plot, but um, <laughs> but you can see that that now it's it's need to ankle deep. The, the kudzu is not going very well at all. And the other thing that's really amazing is the, the, the amount of other plants that are coming up in the kudzu patch. This is just something that you never saw before, uh, before the kudzu bug came along. So, so this is pretty amazing. Uh, we're, we're pretty excited about what it's, what it's going to the kudzu plants. The other thing, we haven't, been able, we haven't measured it yet, but we think that it actually is reducing the, the kudzu's ability to climb up the plant, uh, climb up trees. So. So that would be a really good thing. Um, population trends, you know, that first year you get huge numbers of bugs coming in. As it starts to knock the kudzu back, the, uh, the number of bugs goes down somewhat, and uh, that also reduces the pressure on people's houses uh, a bit. Uh, it's not saying that they won't go to people's houses, but at least there's fewer of them. Uh, we did look at host range. One of the things we're concerned about is what other things did it feed on? We don't want to feed them to see it feeding on all the looms. So we tested a bunch of different uh, species of uh, looms. Uh, some of the less that uh, Basically, uh, the most important thing here is obviously they feed, they laid eggs on uh, kudzu and soybeans in large numbers, and it did complete development on the soybeans as we uh, kind of already knew. But the other plants, it, it didn't complete its development on these other plants. Uh, Either the two species of Lespedeza, um, which the American wisteria, yellowwood's a, a native uh, lagoon tree. Uh, we threw in black eyed peas because we had heard that it was causing a problem on some of the, some of the peas, but it really didn't seem to do much on that. And, and again, some of the some of the other native lagoons. So it doesn't seem to be a major. That's going to be a major pest of other uh, lagoons out there. All right, so to, let's talk about the economics of kudzu bug. Uh, so we know now that it's causing 30, 33 to 50 percent reduction in, in kudzu, which is a good thing. Uh, it causes a 19 to 25 percent yield uh, reduction in soybeans if it's left untreated, which is a bad thing. It's uh, attractive to people's houses and it's causing a nuisance, and so many people are actually paying people paying operators to go out and spray their houses to get rid of them, which is not good and which is pretty expensive. Um, and the other thing that's happened uh, is it's gotten into shipping containers. Uh, at businesses that have cuts and pat patches near their uh, businesses they, and they ship out of the country, uh, they've actually had cuts and bugs get in to those or into airplanes and they've been taken to other countries. And Guatemala actually uh, imposed a quarantine on three states for a short time. 
until they kind of calm down. But uh, but it is a, that is a risk. Something that we need to be thinking about is the potential of it to be a, uh, become a quarantine test. Now, uh, Greener did this really neat study, uh, kind of looking at the costs of controlling uh, Pezu and uh, the benefits of controlling it, as well as the, the potential economic returns of doing it. And uh, what they found was that if you eradicate kudzu and replace it with pines, the, uh, the annual land expectation value of what your value would be, the, the land would be worth each year uh, without kudzu and with the pines growing there would be $84 per acre per year. Um, so if you could apply that, and I realize that it's nearly, well, it would never happen that all 7 million acres would be planted in pines. Um, We'd be lucky to say maybe do a million acres, but for theory, there, theoretically, if you could apply that to all seven million acres, uh, that would that would equate to about uh, six hundred million dollars in added value each year uh, in uh, uh, pine production. And then, uh, if you looked at hardwoods, it's obviously uh, quite a bit lower, and that's on a thirty-year rotation, by the way, for pines. Um, if you look at the cost of controlling the pesticide bugs on soybeans, then um, that's about, if you had to tr treat all 9.5 million acres in the south, it would cost about $95 million to do that each year. Again, uh, that's not going to happen. There's, there's not going to be a, a bug problem on all 95 million acres. And it's just like there's not, we're not going to replant 7 million acres of pesticide. But it gives you an idea of the economics of, of uh, the two problems. Um, so, so one possibility is uh, to do, that benefits everybody, I think, is uh, large-scale cuts of control. And uh, this is a benefit, obviously, to forestry. You can, you can remove cuts from the land and uh, plant trees on it. That's a good thing. It uh, benefits municipalities and, land, and homeowners because uh, they have it on parks and along the roadsides. So, uh, they need to get rid of it. Obviously, homeowners uh, would be happy if they didn't have pets and bugs all over their houses. Um, it does reduce, the, it would reduce the risk of exporting it to another country, which would be also good. Uh, it reduces the cost to power line companies, which uh, Georgia Power estimates that it's about two to three million dollars a year that they spend on the uh, on and control around their power line and poles. Uh, reduces the cost to railroads and uh, highways. Uh, again, Kudzu doesn't stop at the, at the rails, so it doesn't stop at the edge of the road. So uh, they are uh, spending a, a fair amount of money on trying to control it. And uh, by removing Kudzu, we also reduce the, uh, the damage to soybeans. So, so it would be, a, uh, I think, a win-win-win for, for everybody involved. And before I become a nuisance like Kudzu here, I'd be glad to try to answer any 